This video is sponsored by NordVPN. Stay tuned to find out how you can take back your privacy online today. Spider-Man Far From Home, for all its merits, had a problem. I mean, the action scenes are great, the acting from everyone involved is well done, the villain has charisma and is certainly a lot more interesting than most other villains in the MCU, but for all of those strengths, this film had an area where it failed so extensively that it held back the film. It kept Far From Home as being a decent, enjoyable superhero film, but prevents it from truly shining and reaching its full potential as one of the best Spider-Man stories that we've ever seen. And what is this film's most condemning failing? It's Spider-Man. Now, this isn't your bog-standard whinge on current-day Spider-Man where I say, oh, the creators don't understand the spirit of Spider-Man's character or something to that effect. Rather, the reason why Spider-Man in this film isn't very interesting, especially when compared to other incarnations of the character, like in Sam Raimi's trilogy or in Spider-Man Homecoming, is because in this film, Spider-Man makes for a frankly weak protagonist. There are so many crucial ingredients that make a protagonist interesting, and Spider-Man in this film lacks most of them, to the point that, dare I say it, it makes Spider-Man a downright boring protagonist. Okay, now, mandatory disclaimer for these kinds of videos, just before you hit the dislike button, hear me out first, but before we break down why Spider-Man in this film makes for a really weak protagonist, we need to first explore the idea of character want versus need. The two elements of want and need are really the cornerstone of any good character motivation. And if you want your character to have an arc, these two things cease to be something you should consider giving your protagonist, and they become pretty much mandatory ingredients if you want to do your arc properly. Simply put, a character's want is their objective they give themselves in the story. It's the surface level goal they have, and it's usually quite a simple one. Meanwhile, their need is usually quite more elusive. It's the deepest desire that character has in their hearts. If you're creating a character arc, that need the character has is something the character is largely unaware of at the start of the story, and said character becomes more aware of that need as time goes along. And all too often, the most fascinating characters take these elements of want versus need and pit them against each other, where the protagonist wants a goal, but their goal, it turns out, has nothing to do with their real need. Or even better, their want is actually destructive, and if they go through with that want, it pushes them further away from what they really need deep inside. But okay, all of this is really rather abstract, and it would certainly help if we had a few good examples to demonstrate why want versus need are so important when creating a compelling protagonist. Let's take Toy Story 1, for example. In the start of this film, our protagonist Woody is Andy's favourite toy, and he is very much enjoying life. Then Buzz Lightyear comes along and steals the spotlight. Now Buzz is Andy's favourite toy, and this makes Woody deeply envious. It presents us with Woody's want, which drives the plot. Woody wants to reclaim his old glory of being the favourite toy again, and he sabotages Buzz in order to achieve it, and in doing so, gets them both lost and devastates Andy. But as the film plays along, Woody realises how deeply selfish his want is, and Woody's need is to recognise that it doesn't actually matter who is Andy's favourite toy, the only thing that matters is that Andy has a favourite toy, that he is happy, and that Woody is there for him in whatever capacity capacity Andy needs him to be. Here's another great example in Shrek. Shrek wants to live in his swamp alone, then a mass of fairy tale creatures squat on his land, and this motivates his want and therefore the plot. Shrek wants privacy. His need, however, is to realise that a life with loved ones is so much more fulfilling than living alone. And when he finally achieves his want, when he finally gets all these squatters off his land at the very end of Act 2, while the Shrek we see at the start would have been over the moon to achieve this, Shrek now just feels hollow because now he knows what it's like to feel love, and realises that his want was the opposite of his far more important need, and the rest of the film is him pursuing that need as he chases after Princess Fiona. This makes Shrek an incredibly engaging protagonist. So, those are two examples where want vs need are well fleshed out and done so to great effect, making for interesting protagonists that go on interesting journeys. Now, let's apply that concept to Spider-Man Far From Home. 
home. So in this film, what does Spider-Man want? And well, Spider-Man's want is twofold. He wants to stop the monsters in the first half of the film, then stop Mysterio in the second half. Okay, that's our want. It's a pretty simple one, but that's okay. A want is totally allowed to be as simple as that. But what's really important, and what requires a lot more thought, is his need. What does Spider-Man need to happen in this film? And that is exactly it. It's one of the reasons why Spider-Man felt so boring to me, or at the absolute least, is a lot less interesting than he otherwise could have been. Because he doesn't actually have anything he needs. I mean, you could say he needs to get with Mary Jane, but he already wants to be with her at the start of the movie, so that's just another one. And if the protagonist of your story has no internal need that they work their way towards achieving, said character will be all the more boring for it. I mean, what's absolutely brilliant at showcasing how weak Spider-Man's motivation is in this film is this line of dialogue. So after the first monster appears and is defeated, Spider-Man says this. What are you gonna do about the water monster? Nothing. Besides, that Mysterio guy's all over him. Look, I just wanna spend some time with MJ. We were talking about Paris and I think she really likes me. But hold on, because this presents a bizarre inconsistency. Spider-Man says he doesn't want to fight the monsters. He just wants to enjoy his holiday. But he clearly does get involved with the plot because otherwise there wouldn't be a movie. So where the hell does Spider-Man get his motivation from? Well, it's rather simple. Nick Fury comes up to Peter and asks him to get involved. And that's it. Th that, that is his motivation. There's nothing personal about it. He doesn't feel this profound need to defend the innocent or get revenge or anything resembling a powerful emotion. His motivation is that Nick Fury just asked him to get involved. That's really boring. But that weak motivation alone isn't necessarily a death sentence. I mean, this is exactly how it is in Spider-Man Homecoming. In Spider-Man Homecoming, Peter wants to stop the Vulture and generally stop the bad guys because that's what heroes do. But you know what? Spider-Man in that film still makes for a pretty decent protagonist. So why is Spider-Man a less interesting hero in Far From Home compared to Homecoming? Well, it's because there are many things that make a protagonist interesting, and you don't necessarily need to tick every single box in order to have an interesting character. Your protagonist doesn't require a character arc in order to be a good protagonist. I mean, it really helps if you have one, but you can make a good story without it. However, and this is a big however, if you're going to deny your protagonist a character arc, you simply must make up for it in some way. And from what I've seen, a great commonly used way to make up for this is to make your protagonist as proactive as possible. I mean, sure, they're the exact same character at the start and end of your story, but they're just so damn proactive from start to finish that we can't help but be fascinated by their story. I think a great example of this kind of protagonist is Marty in Back to the Future. Marty doesn't really have an arc in that first film, does he? But he's so extraordinarily tenacious in his efforts to get back to his time and fix his mistakes in messing up the timeline that he makes for a perfectly interesting protagonist. Marty affects the plot. The plot does not affect him. So making Spider-Man extremely active in this film would have been vitally important to remedying the fact that he lacks a strong need and character arc. And certainly, under no circumstances can we have Nick Fury prodding him with a stick for the first half of the movie and changing Spider-Man's holiday plans against his will to force force him to get involved and fight the monsters, and Spider-Man just begrudgingly sighs and goes along with it as the definition of passive. That's the absolute last thing we should do, and, uh, oh, that's, uh, that's exactly what they do. Um, and this really is salt in the wound, because not only does Spider-Man have a weak motivation, he is also extraordinarily passive. And again, your protagonist doesn't need to tick all the boxes in order to be interesting, but now we've entered the realm where Spider-Man is lacking in two of the most crucial building blocks that makes a good protagonist, and all of a sudden, his interest as a character is really starting to wane. Now, I know a lot of you are probably thinking this, and quite possibly angrily typing a comment about it right now, but doesn't Spider-Man have a need in this film? It's the need to fill the shoes of Tony Stark. 
right? I mean, it certainly seems that way on the surface level. It's even in the trailer. Uh, Spider-Man looks at street art of Tony and is afraid about the idea of living up to the next Tony Stark. In the beginning, when a journalist asks him what it's like to take over from Tony Stark, Spider-Man has a small panic attack, then runs away from the event, obviously showing that he's terrified about the idea. You'd think that establishes Spider-Man's need in this movie. But this exposition, it's like the writers introducing a check Chekhov's gun. A very tantalising, intriguing Chekhov's gun, then immediately throwing it out the window, because this had the potential to be a really interesting need for Spider-Man, provided they weaved it into the plot and fleshed this idea out. But they didn't. Because aside from that press moment in the beginning, we have only two moments in this whole film where the concept of him being the next Iron Man is addressed. When Spider-Man gives the glasses to Beck because he doesn't have faith in himself, and when in the jet just before the climax, Happy tells him that he shouldn't want to be like Tony because Tony was secretly a very guilt and anxiety ridden man and is the kind of guy that you don't really want as a role model. Those are the only moments this apparent need of Spider-Man's is addressed rest and that is not how you do a character need. You can't just mention it three times in a two hour long movie and never show that he's grown in between those sparse moments. I mean that talk on the plane with Happy, that just so happens to be the end of the second act, which means that throughout the entire third act, his mission to be the next Tony Stark is never even addressed. It plays no role in his motivations. There is no dialogue talking about it in the entirety of Act 3, even in the wind down when we have our falling action. In Far From Home, Spider-Man's need is so often forgotten about, is so poorly fleshed out, that calling it his need in the first place is unduly overgenerous. I mean, what makes this neglect of Spider-Man's need in this film so appalling is it would have been just so easy to add a few scenes here and there, a few bits of dialogue to flesh this out and make his character so much more interesting. So okay, we never have any resolution to this apparent need, and Happy's motivational talk on the jet, that just wasn't enough. If we're going to be able to call this an arc, Spider-Man must come to a final epiphany as to exactly how he's going to fill Iron Man's shoes, so uh, how about we have a scene just after the final battle. So when Spider-Man got Edith in the first place, the note that came with it says, for the next Tony Stark I trust you. And after Beck's death, Peter is on the tower bridge thinking things over. He pulls out that crumpled note, looks to the sky and says something like, I don't want to. I'm sorry Tony, but I can't. I've tried and I just can't live up to being the next you. So I'm done trying. I know this isn't what you wanted, but it's what I want. I want to be my own man, to make my own way in life. I don't want to fill your shoes because I already have my own. I'm not Iron Man. I'm Spider-Man. And then he throws the note into the river, programs the Edith satellite to fall out of orbit and burn up in the atmosphere so no one can use it as a weapon anymore, and he deletes her operating system from the glasses, and then throws the glasses into the river as well. Now that would have been a brilliant way to resolve his apparent need in this film, and give him an interesting arc where he decides to take a big step towards adulthood, and learns the lesson that just because a parental figure wants you to do something, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the best thing for you to do. And sometimes you need to be your own person, make your own decisions in life and go against what other people want you to do, even if you respect them. That would have been such a great way to flesh out Peter's need in this film to the point where it's justified in calling it a need. And they could have done other things, little bits of dialogue here and there to flesh this idea out into a proper good arc. And it would have been so easy to do a lot of these things that it's really inexcusable that they didn't. I mean, how about when he first meets Fury, Fury tells him that he has no faith in him. Maybe Fury says it while Spider-Man is eavesdropping, that Peter is just not good enough to be the next Tony Stark. He's naive and childish, and this fills Peter with self-doubt. Or maybe he just tells Peter to his face that he needs to be so much better than he currently is, else he'll never live up to being the next Iron Man. And Spider-Man then, over the course of the movie, tries and fails to do exactly what Fury wants 
wants him to do and be more like Tony. Spider-Man's want should have been to be the next Tony Stark and his need should have been to realise that he should aspire to be the best version of himself and not somebody else. And that would give him a powerful arc. But of course they didn't do that. Instead, his need comes across as half-baked. Like the writers laid 30% of the groundwork for a character arc, told themselves, hey, we'll just flesh it out in the second draft, but then totally forgot to do that. And I said earlier that Spider-Man is extremely passive in this film. And the thing is, if you ask me, the fact he is so passive is actually more damning than his lack of any internal need. And I mean, need is great. If Spider-Man had one, it would have undoubtedly made the movie so much better. But if you ask me, an active protagonist with no arc is more interesting than a passive character with an arc. And it just so happens that Spider-Man is one of the most passive protagonists we have ever seen before in a superhero movie, both Marvel and DC included. But before we break that down, recently I've discovered this money upfront multi-level marketing scheme that I think you should absolutely join. And with this business model, you'll make tons of money in no time. Spider-Man! Using access to Edith, I have found your IP address, and now I know exactly where you live and I can DDoS you and shut your internet down. Not to mention I can see everything you do while you browse, especially when you use your phone on public Wi-Fi. And now the world will be mine! <laughs> Not so fast, Mysterio! I've installed NordVPN on these glasses. What? No! That's right, now my information is secure, and not only can my government no longer spy on everything I do, but neither can any of the tech giants like Google or my service provider. And now, you can't either. By buying NordVPN, I now feel comfortable while browsing the internet, as I know that the only person in the whole world who knows what I've been looking at is me. My privacy is now entirely in my hands again, and your plans for world domination are foiled. Ah, curse you NordVPN with your insanely reasonable prices and fast connection speeds! I know, and don't forget their military grade encryption that makes it next to impossible for anyone looking at your devices to understand what you're even looking at for added privacy. Ah yes, I forgot about that one. Thanks for reminding me Spider-Man. Curse that too! <laughs> this is so cringe. This is so cringe and I love it. And all I had to do to sign up was click that link in the description, nordvpn.com forward slash the closer look, or use code the closer look at the checkout for 70% off a three year plan, plus a month extra for free. Kaisers, now my plans are ruined and. Uh, wait, what? 70% off? That sounds like a great deal! Let me sign up right now! What did you say I had to do again? Click that link in the description, that's nordvpn.com forward slash the closer look, or use the code the closer look at the checkout. But you'll never get the chance to use this incredible service, villain! What? No! For a mongoose and a rather overripe mango. And that is exactly why I sent that $40,000 to my long lost Nigerian uncle. Uh, anyway, Spider Man in this film is extraordinarily passive. Fury tells him to do something, so he obeys without a word of objection. The monsters attack, Spider Man reacts. Spider Man is given the information that Mysterio is about to attack London, so he reacts and goes to meet him there. And frankly, the only moment in this entire film where Spider Man shows true, as in, like, true proactivity is when he makes the decision to give the glasses to Beck. This moment is actually great because it makes Spider-Man active and I mean you could be really nitpicky and say well he was manipulated into making this decision by the bad guys so even if this is his one moment of proactivity it has a watered down effect because it's all a part of the villain's plan. But to give credit where credit is due this moment does a wonderful job at telling us Spider-Man is afraid and lacks self confidence so a big thumbs up to the creators. However, it's nowhere near enough. One good choice isn't enough to redeem a character who is otherwise wholly passive. And this actually presents a pretty good segue into a really interesting question. 
Why do we find active characters so much more interesting than passive ones? I mean, it would be helpful to know, right? Uh, if you ask me, there are tons of reasons why, and it's a pretty complex answer, so much so that I barely understand it myself. Uh, but one thing that's for absolute sure, part of the reason why proactive characters are the most interesting types of characters is because they are the ones who make the choices. While a passive character lets the choices get made on his behalf, the active one chooses between two or more options, and in doing so, reveals a ton about who they are deep inside, thus making them interesting. The thing is, character choice is actually a brilliant device from a writer's perspective. I mean, if you think your character could do with being a little more interesting, a fantastic way to do it would be to force them to make an insanely difficult choice at some point in your story. Say, for example, if they own a weapons manufacturing company and love that fact. Then they see how terrible an effect said company is having on the world and is hurting good people. So then he shuts down the weapons manufacturing branch of his weapons production company and shows he's grown. I mean, I can't think of any examples quite like that, that's just a hypothetical. Uh, but if you make your protagonist make decisions like that, they inherently become all the more fascinating to your audience. Audience. You can do so many things with character choice. You can have them choose a path that turns out to be a terrible mistake, causing your character to feel profound regret, causing internal conflict and making them three-dimensional. If your character has an arc, you can have them make a choice at the start of your story that displays their self-centered ways. Then they make another choice near the end of your story that showcases how much they've changed and ties their arc in a neat little bow. But this presents a pretty interesting learning opportunity because while character choice can make your character fascinating, it can also do absolutely nothing to make your character more interesting. There are tons of examples where a character makes a choice and it is as boring as if he never made that choice at all. But how does that make any sense, right? Uh, how can one choice reveal so much about a character and make them fascinating while another reveals nothing and is tedious boring by comparison. Well, it's this. On the surface level, it could seem like your character has a strong agency because said character makes a decision. Look at Far From Home, for example. MJ discovers a camera from a drone and gives it to Spider-Man. It then plays a hologram from the fight, and Spider-Man realises that Mysterio is a hack and has been playing them all for fools. He then decides to go tell Nick Fury about this. And that's a decision right? Uh, Spider-Man finds something out, then chooses to act on it and tells someone. Well, yes, of course that is a decision, but it's also one of the most boring ways of having character choice in your story. Because when the correct choice to make is so glaringly obvious, when there is only one viable path and every other option is so ridiculously idiotic that only a madman would pick it, and then your character makes the most obvious choice, that is when the element of choice in your story is at its most insipid. The times when choice is the most fascinating device is when that choice is grey. When there are multiple paths ahead, at least two of which viable. But if you want an example of exactly that, what makes for an outstanding choice in fiction, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a better example than in Batman Begins, where the League of Shadows, as the final act of Bruce's training, demands he executes a criminal. This criminal is a murderer, and the world is against him. A whole cabal of highly trained assassins is around Bruce, any of which could kill him, all of which egg him on to do the deed, and Bruce refuses, then fights his way out. This right here makes for fantastic fiction, and what makes this choice so bloody powerful is the fact that there are multiple viable options he can take. He can kill the criminal, which would be extremely easy. All he'd have to do is do a quick slice, he would earn the admiration and respect of his peers, and life would be looking pretty good for him. If Bruce cared more about himself than other people, this would absolutely be the path he'd take. Or alternatively, Bruce could 
can take the insanely difficult option of refusing what everyone wants him to do. We remember that guy who wanted to kill his parents killer and would have done so if someone hadn't done it before him. And now he is choosing to save the life of someone who is just as evil as the man who he'd planned to kill. This choice does an outstanding job at displaying the progression of his moral code. We see that he's becoming Batman. This right here is a great example of how choice can be used to potent effect in fiction. Because when you do it right, it not only makes your character proactive, it not only moves the plot forwards, but crucially it is, in my opinion, the hands down best way of giving your audience insight into who your character truly is deep inside. I mean, dialogue is great. If you have a character explain their moral compass to another character, that can make for a great scene and reveal who they are to the audience. But if you had the option of picking a well-written dialogue exchange where a character explains their morality, or having an action scene where your character displays their morality and makes an active decision that affects the plot, that second scene will do a better job at showcasing your character and entertaining your audience 99% of the time. I mean, okay, here's a better alternative for Spider-Man discovering that Mysterio is the bad guy. How about instead of just being handed the drone piece that makes him suspicious, he takes the initiative. So he notices that the attacks are following a pattern, and he, because of his own agency, realises that the next monster appearance will be in Prague before anyone else does. So without consulting anyone, he goes, and then he gets ready and prepares for the attack. He knows it's a fire monster, so he gets hoses and rigs this whole system with a water fountain to fight the fire, but only then does he notice someone being shifty down below, and this piques his curiosity. This turns out to be one of Mysterio's goons who is setting up the hologram system, doing some last second touches to the display. Then Spider-Man yanks on this thread, pulls a Batman, ties the guy up upside down, and gets answers out of him, and discovers Mysterio's secret plan. And instead of simply being passive, instead of MJ giving him this drone piece and him being told Mysterio is a bad guy, Spider-Man perseveres and discovers, entirely because of his own agency, that something is wrong. If the film did it this way, it would have done wonders to make his character more interesting. The thing is, you can easily have an active protagonist while the villain is also being active themselves. The thing about The Dark Knight is it could have so easily fallen for this inactivity problem that Far From Home does. But it doesn't. Throughout the film, the Joker and the mob are causing chaos and being this destructive force, but what does Batman do? Does he lie in wait in his cave until he gets a phone call saying that Joker is committing crimes and then he goes? No. He perseveres. He wants to take out the mob. Their money launderer flies back to Asia. Does Batman passively twiddle his thumbs and wait? No. He takes the initiative. He leaves his comfort zone and goes to this new continent and kidnaps the money launderer. Even though the villains are being an active force, Batman is an active force himself. We see Batman endlessly throughout the entire runtime of this movie, trying so very hard to take the initiative. And even though a good amount of this activity is in vain because the Joker's plan goes off flawlessly anyway, Batman's character is all the more engaging for it. But how can we apply this to Spider-Man Far From Home? Well, how about in an improved version, Happy is the one who gives Spider-Man the glasses. He hands them over at the start of the film, and just as Spider-Man is getting used to them, the Elementals attack New York. Let's say Peter is good friends with the shopkeeper at his local store, and when the Elementals attack, the shopkeeper dies in his arms, and this inspires him. Whoever this force is, it attacked his hometown. It killed his friend. He finds the pattern and realises that the next attack will be in Europe, a place not too far away from where he's about to go on holiday. And he uses that holiday to go on a mission to hunt down the elementals so no one else will get hurt or lose their friends like he did. In this improved version, Nick Fury doesn't ask Spider-Man for help. Spider-Man hunts down Nick Fury and asks him for help. He tells him that this monster attacked his hometown, and he wants to help take it down and save lives. But Fury says no, because he already has Mysterio, who is a grown adult. He doesn't need anyone else, and Spider-Man is just a kid. Fury doesn't want a child on the battlefield because he'll just get hurt. So while Fury and Mysterio are in Europe dealing with the monsters, Spider-Man, against the will of Fury and everyone else, perseveres and independently hunts down the monsters. 
While Fury and Mysterio are the passive characters as they react when the attacks happen, Spider-Man finds out where these attacks will happen beforehand and by finding the pattern, preemptively tries to stop them before they happen. Instead of Edith buying the opera tickets, Peter digs into his university fund, goes online and pays for those opera tickets himself, shelling out tens of thousands of dollars over the course of the film and essentially drains his savings in order to hunt this creature down and stop more deaths. And then we combine this with the idea earlier of him on the arc to be the next Tony Stark when he ultimately rejects and decides to be his own man. And all of a sudden, Spider-Man stopped being a bland protagonist and he's become fascinating, hasn't he? And ultimately, we still have the exact same plot, except for maybe an alteration to the first couple scenes where the monsters attack New York instead of attacking Venice. All we've really done is tweak the plot so Spider-Man is the one who pushes himself to act, rather than other people pushing him, and it makes the film all the more entertaining. And maybe this presents a mini arc for the supporting characters. I mean, it would have been really cool if Fury starts the film not having the slightest respect for Spider-Man, thinking he's just a kid who's got no place fighting criminals. But due to his tenacious perseverance and the fact that Spider-Man uncovers alone the truth about Mysterio and essentially saves Fury's life, Fury learns to respect Spider-Man and we end on a note where Fury says that the next time he's got a problem, Peter will be the first person he comes to. In Homecoming, Peter had this issue where he was desperate to get into the action, but Happy and Tony didn't respect him enough so weren't giving him any jobs. But now, because of Spider-Man's perseverance, Fury has learned to respect him and think of him not as a child but as a capable adult. Now Spider-Man will have his hands full with good deeds to do, which is what he's always wanted. And he's no longer doing these deeds as Iron Man's protege, he's doing them as Spider-Man. And that would be a great note to end the film on. Anyway, thanks for watching, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time on The Closer Look.